Hello and welcome to Pulmonary Embolus Nursing Care. My name is David Woodruff. I'm the editor of Critical Care Nursing Made Incredibly Easy. I hope to make this incredibly easy for you too. First of all, let's talk a little bit about what is a pulmonary embolus. A pulmonary embolus occurs because we have a clot that goes to the pulmonary vasculature. So it's not in the airways, it's actually in the vasculature of the lung. These clots are often formed elsewhere in the body. They get mobilized, that's hence the embolus, and then they move to the lung. So where do the clots come from? For the most part, the clots are coming from the calf. So they're coming from the lower leg, and it's the result of having DVTs that are forming in those lower legs because of some poor valves. As is illustrated in the picture here, we have a varicose vein that is occurring, and it doesn't have to be a varicose vein. We can also have some poor function of our valves that are allowing blood to slow down a little bit, coagulate, form some clots in the lower legs, and then that clot becomes mobilized, and hence an embolus. So the clots are forming in the lower legs. They're forming down there because our circulation is a little bit slower down in the lower legs than it is elsewhere in the body because it's further from the heart. And unless we're having adequate pumping of the calf muscle, so which means people are getting up and walking around, then we can have clots forming in the lower extremity. Again, the clot breaks free, clot comes back up through the venous circulation, and then goes through the right side of the heart. Risk factors for a DVT, deep vein thrombosis, this is also called a thromboembolus, and pulmonary embolus, include age-related factors such as vascular tone, a sedentary lifestyle, cardiac output. So decreased cardiac output, our patients who have cardiac issues and heart failure are also going to have sluggish circulation. Atherosclerosis narrows the vessels as well. So you know, take a look at all of those age-related factors that can contribute to slowing down the blood flow and therefore causing clots to form in those lower extremities. Immobility is going to contribute as well, so bed rest, or sitting for long periods of time. Those people who sit at a desk all day working, and that's another risk factor. We have a dependent area in the lower extremities, and that could be causing clots to form. Family history, genetics are also involved. So this genetic piece uh, we think may have a larger impact than uh, we thought in the past, but uh, don't really have a lot of data about how we're going to be able to analyze that and find those genetic issues in our patients. Other risk factors include surgery or trauma. Uh, remember, these things are going to cause an inflammatory response in the body, and of course, after surgery, we cut through skin, etc., or with trauma, we're hoping to have clotting form. So somebody has an open wound, and we'd expect that there would be clotting forming. Well, the clotting can be a little bit out of control here and causing clots in areas that we don't need them, and then we can have blood clots and emboli occur. Pregnancy, birth control pills, inflammatory disease of any kind. Remember, inflammation, there's three things that happen with inflammation, vasodilation, capillary permeability, and clotting, and the clotting piece is the piece that could be contributing here to our DVT or our pulmonary embolus. Cancer and cancer treatments both can increase our risk, obesity, and smoking. So since the clots are coming from the lower extremities, when we're assessing for our deep vein thrombosis or our thromboembolism, we want to be looking for that area and assessing that area. Now you can see in the picture on the right here, Looking at the two calves, we see that the right calf, which is illustrated on the left side there, is considerably larger than the other calf. So that is one of the characteristics we may see is that because of the clot that we're having a back up of our venous flow and that's causing some swelling there. So pain, tenderness, we can check the circumference to see if the circumference is getting larger as a result of our pooling blood and the blood pooling there as a result of having a clot. Skin characteristics, look at the color. You see a little difference in skin color between those two calves. The one on the left picture is a little larger. You know, the one with the arrow is a little bit larger than the one on the right and a little bit redder. So you can see the distension. You can see the color. If we felt it, we may feel that it's warmer than the one on the uh, right side of the picture. 
Diagnostically, we can look for the uh, PT, PTT, and that's going to give us some indication about patient's clotting factors. And notice that they're doing an ultrasound here, and the, the place they're focusing on right now is that area behind the knee. Uh, that's an area that oftentimes will uh, result in having a clot stick there uh, because of the bending in the circulation. We can look at our platelets. We can look at our fibrinogen or D-dimer test, and D-dimer is going to elevate whenever we have clots in the body. So that's a common test. Now remember again, an elevated D-dimer does not tell you you have a PE or a DVT. It just tells you that we have clotting occurring somewhere. So that clotting could be the result of surgery. It could be the result of trauma or some other inflammatory process that's going on. But a positive D-dimer, along with other risk factors for a PE, is a pretty good indication that your patient may be having a pulmonary embolus. Ultrasound, as we're seeing here, to look at those lower extremities. Chest x-ray can help to rule out other causes for the patient having shortness of breath and uh, having some chest pain, and the CT scan. So we can take a look at our CT to help to find any vascular issues in the lung. Hemodynamic effects. So again, looking at our picture that we started with over here on the right-hand side, you see the clot coming up through the venous circulation, the inferior vena cava going into the right atrium, down into the right ventricle, and it's getting pumped out into the pulmonary artery and into the lungs. Then the clot is going to stop. It's gonna get clogged up in one of those vessels in the lung. The vessels in the lung are going to be the first place where the vascular starts to narrow. So this is really important because as that clot started up in the lower extremities, it's going through bigger vessels and bigger vessels and bigger vessels all the way back to the heart and then goes through the heart. And then when it gets into that pulmonary artery and the vessels start to narrow, that's where it's going to get stuck. So this vessel is stuck with having this embolus that's obstructing the blood flow to the lung, not the, the ventilation, but the blood flow, the perfusion. Blood will back up into the right heart. It's gonna increase the afterload for the right heart, causing potentially right heart failure. Because we don't have as much blood flow getting through the lung to the left side of the heart, we can also see decreased blood flow to the left heart, which is causing decreased cardiac output and eventually shock. So these are the hemodynamic effects that can occur as a result of a PE. When we talk about hemodynamics in patients who have pulmonary embolism, we break this up into three different categories of PE. We have our massive PE, which is hemodynamically unstable. So again, because that clot happened to be large enough in the lung vasculature, it's decreasing blood flow to the left side of the heart, causing the right side to fail, left side will start to fail, and now we have a hemodynamically unstable patient. If that lasts for 15 minutes or more, we call it a massive PE, and this is a patient who may need inotropic support, and we're probably gonna do some invasive type of procedure to eliminate that PE. The submassive, and this is still a fairly large PE because we're getting right ventricular dysfunction. So we might see that on an echocardiogram. We might see that on our EKG, but we're not having hypotension. So the left side is managing to keep up with our cardiac output. Then we have our low risk PE, which the patient does not have hypotension and does not have right ventricular dysfunction. So it's a low risk type of PE. We're gonna be more conservative in our treatment when hypotension is not present. The lung effects, well, you know, it's a clot in the lung. We have an area of the lung that is not being perfused. And as that area is not being perfused, not only will we not have gas exchange, but we're also going to have damage to the lung tissue itself. So ventilation will continue. You listen to the lungs, you hear lung sounds, no difference, right? Because it's not a problem with ventilation, it's a problem with perfusion. There's going to be a decreased dead space, and this can lead to hypoxia and tachycardia. So remember again, in those low risk type PEs where we're not having hypotension, this tachycardia may be our only sign that the patient's having a PE. And that tachycardia is caused by having the back pressure on the right side of the heart. We're not having perfusion of this alveolus, so we're going to have a VQ mismatch. V stands for ventilation, Q stands for perfusion, so there's a ventilation-perfusion mismatch. Now imagine that this vessel here was occluded by having a blood clot in the vessel. 
So we're not going to have that perfusion past that alveolus. We're still having ventilation. Air is going in and out. Nothing happened to the airflow yet, but there's no perfusion. So the gas exchange is not going to occur in that alveolus. Now you make that a million alveoli, and now we've got a big problem with the patient being able to perfuse. Symptom-wise, we can anticipate looking for those signs of a DVT. So we're looking for those venous thromboemboli. Patients could be experiencing chest pain, the chest pain from the clot itself, from the damage that's occurring to the lung, or from the backup of blood causing some stress on the heart. Dyspnea, tachypnea, cough, hemoptysis, and remember again, your number one sign is going to be that the patient's going to have tachycardia. Treatment-wise, DVT prophylaxis, so we want to try to eliminate any further clots from occurring. Anticoagulation, hemodynamic st stabilization, so we want to make sure that hemodynamically we're maintaining a blood pressure, we're maintaining perfusion in this patient. We may actually do a thrombectomy, so going in with our cath and actually removing the clot from the lung, or we may do thrombolysis in a number of ways, either systemic just breaking down all the clots, or maybe doing local type of thrombolysis if we can reach it with our catheterization and get into that vessel and just inject the TPA right into that particular clot so that we don't have to systemically thrombolyze the patient. So our take-home message is that most of the clots that cause PE come from the legs. So that's where we should be assessing, assessing the legs. Assess for DVT. A pulmonary embolism affects the circulation, so we're assessing for hemodynamic stability. Respiratory distress is going to be secondary to the vascular effects, which is causing the VQ mismatch. So we want to restore our blood flow while maintaining oxygenation and prevent further clots by getting that patient up, moving them around so they're squeezing the calf, and with anticoagulation. To learn more about nursing emergencies, check out our nursing emergencies program at thenursingprof.com. Help you to decrease complications, rapidly detect problems, and implement prompt interaction in your patient. Thank you for joining me for Pulmonary Embolus Nursing Care. My name is David Woodruff. Until next time, bye now.